Hi guys, it's your friendly neighborhood headbanger Terry, and I hope that you are doing well. I'm doing well, thank you. And tonight, I want to talk about masks. And this might be the point where some of you just scream and go running into the wilderness and say, no, I'm not going to watch anything about that. And that's fine. If you, if you need to check out, that's cool. I understand that. But I just feel led to talk about it. And uh, full disclosure, I am pro-masks, uh, but we're going to talk about it in what I hope is a reasoned and calm manner, and I'm not going to call names, and um, you know, I'm not going to put anybody down or anything. I'm just going to give what I hope are some well-reasoned facts, and I'm going to, oh, yay, my cat knocked something off of the table. Way to go. That's Sophie knocking things off of uh, her dining room table, which she's really good at. Uh, I have three kind of areas that I want to talk to you about where masks are concerned. Um, one is from a logical standpoint, the other is from a patriotic standpoint, and the third one is from a faith-based standpoint. And hang with me on that one, even if you are agnostic or atheist, I think there are some things there that you would agree with on just an ethical level, if nothing else. But the first we're going to talk about is logical. And I recently uh, came across a Brigham Young University study, BYU study, that, is, uh, that was a meta-study. And a meta-study simply means that they study other studies. And in this case, they broke down um, and looked very carefully at 115 scientific and medical studies from the United States and other countries throughout the world. And what they found after crunching all the numbers and looking at all the data was that masks can block up to 90% of dispersal droplets. And that simply means uh, sneezes, coughs, talking, singing, screaming, whatever. So we're basically talking snot and spit if you just want to get right down to the nitty gritty of it. They also came to the conclusion that if 80%, if 80% of the public would wear a mask, then we would have a much quicker and a safer way back to normal. And we could, you know, get back to a place where we could sort of, I guess, call it normal if people would do that. And masks, social distancing, and hand washing are the three things that are going to get us back to that place. And um, all of them are, are important. So the second thing is that, and was learned from this study, was that you may possibly be asymptomatic. It just simply means that you might be carrying the virus, but you don't show any symptoms from the virus. In other words, you are typhoid Mary. And the CDC estimates that there's somewhere around 40% of people who, are, um, who are, are positive with COVID are asymptomatic. So in other words, uh, not everybody who is carrying the COVID virus is walking around coughing and sneezing and, and wheezing and saying they can't breathe. Some of them look just like you and I. Um, another thing is that if you are asymptomatic, you are 75% as likely to pass on the virus as someone who was symptomatic. So just because you're asymptomatic doesn't mean that you can't pass it on to someone else. You have a 75% as much chance, uh, and that is according to the CDC. So you are just about as, as contagious as someone who, who is showing signs. So you have to remember that. That's another reason, you know, you just don't know. You don't know if you're sick. And I hear a lot of people say, I don't need to wear a mask because I'm not sick. Well, you might not be, but you might be one of that 40%. And it, there's just no way to tell um, unless you're tested. All right, people who should not wear a mask. There are people who should not wear a mask. And I have always said this. I've been very upfront about this. Um, children under two should not wear a mask because they don't know how to put it on properly. They don't know how to keep it on properly. You know, they might try to eat it. And just uh, toddlers will put anything in their mouth. And so children under two just don't need to wear a mask. And it's just not recommended for them by the CDC. 
people with severe breathing issues, severe asthma, severe COPD. Now, studies are coming out that people that have well-regulated asthma and people with under control COPD actually can wear masks for a while. Not all day, but they can wear them for a short time. But if you have any of those uh, conditions are severe in your case, then it's not recommended. Um, people with severe panic issues, and I actually know someone who uh, had that problem and she actually just trained herself by wearing it a little bit at a time to be able to go out and wear a mask. And I thought that was really awesome. I realized not everybody would be able to do that. So um, if you have severe panic issues or severe trauma issues and uh, wearing a mask would cause you to have a panic attack, then that's something that you, you know, might want to think about and talk to your doctor about. But, you know, it, it's recognized that that could be an issue. And anyone who cannot take their mask off by themselves, someone who is disabled, um, should not wear a mask if there isn't someone around who could help them. Because that could get them upset, that could cause them to have a panic attack. So you just don't want that to happen. You want to make sure that if you have someone who is disabled, who would not be able to take their mask off, that there's going to be someone there who could help them with that. Okay? All right. So, let's talk about the mask itself, and this is the one that my family wears when we go out. And this is a pretty common one. You see this one a lot. This is the, um, well, it's not net technically a surgical mask because it's not up to that grade, but it is non-woven and three-ply, which is what is recommended. And the reason that... Um, this one is recommended is, I mean, you could use other things. You can use a bandana, you can use a t-shirt, you know, anything is better than nothing. But the reason that this one is recommended, one of the reasons is it is very light. Uh, people who say that wearing a mask is uncomfortable, I really, really urge you to get, you can get these on Amazon and they come in a 50, uh, 50 count pack. And it's very light. I put this on my food scale that I use to measure food portions. And it was 0 0.14 ounces or 4 grams. So this is 4 grams on your face. Give me just one minute. Um, Okie doke. <laughs> My husband was attempting to use Bluetooth headphones, but they weren't turned on, apparently. All right, moving on. So the mask itself um, is, just doesn't weigh that much. Um, ask a service member how much a gas mask weighs and they will tell you it is not that much. It weighs a lot more than 0 0.14 ounces. The second thing is that masks do not lower oxygen saturation. They don't. This is all over the internet and some some of it is by medical professionals, and I don't know who they are because um, this has just been disproved time and time again. Um, the American Lung Association uh, says that this is not true, that the buildup of CO2 is not a problem, and the lack of oxygen is not a problem, and that's because non-woven masks, like the one I just showed you, and, and even ones that are, are woven, but non-woven masks especially, are porous and because they are porous little tiny oxygen atoms and little tiny co2 atoms can go back and forth co2 can go out oxygen can come in so the only exception to this would be if you had an n95 mask which is the really high level mask that medical professionals use in extremely infectious um, situations that mask is woven to keep everything out. It's extremely tight fitting. It's everything is sealed in. And after a while, it will become difficult to breathe in, in that mask because it is completely woven and non-porous and completely sealed shut. Anything else that you're wearing, a bandana, the mask I showed you, a t-shirt, a scarf, whatever, is going to be porous enough to let oxygen in and CO2 out. And I will give you a personal example of this. A couple of weeks ago, I was in the hospital um, at the ER. Nothing serious. I was okay. But the minute that I got there, they put a mask on me, obviously. 
And I was there for four hours with this mask on. And I was talking to people and the nurses were talking to me and they had their masks on. And I was hooked up to monitors. And one of the things that was being monitored was my CO2 level, or excuse me, not my CO2, my oxygen level. And my oxygen level never got lower than 97%. Most of the time it was at 99 or 100. And, you know, it's not considered low. I think low is considered 93% maybe, <clears throat> less than that. So it didn't get anywhere close to low. I never felt like I couldn't breathe. I never felt like, um, you know, I was hindered in any way, shape, or form. I could talk perfectly fine. They could understand me. I could understand them. So... That's just not a thing that CO2 is going to build up and cause you to pass out. Because if it were, every doctor and nurse would be passed out all over the nation, and that would be bad. So I don't think they would wear a mask that would, you know, have them be doing that. So another thing is that no one is asking you to wear a mask 24-7. Um, that just doesn't need to happen. Do you need to put one on when you go out in public and you're going to be with people where you can't socially distance? Sure. Uh, grocery store, Walmart, Target, uh, you know, places that are crowded that you are going to be around people and you just can't get away from it. Do you need to wear it at home? Not unless you're sick and someone in your family is sick. In that case, then yeah, that'd be a good idea, but not if everyone is, is, is healthy as far as you know. You don't need to wear it in the car if uh, you're the only person in the car or if you have a family member in the car that lives in your household. You don't need to wear it then. You don't need to wear it if you're someplace where you can socially dis uh, distance. If you're taking a hike in the forest or somewhere like that, you don't need to wear it then. So it, no one is saying that it has, it has to be worn all the time. We're just saying that there are certain cases where it, you know, better safe than sorry. And those are usually in cases where you are out in public and it is difficult to socially distance. Uh, doctor's offices is another one. That's another important one. And let's see. Let me turn the page because I'm going with some notes here. Okay, so log the logical, that was the logical part. Now we're going to go to the patriotic part. Um, I love my country, and I'm sure you love it as well if you're from the United States. And I want my country to be successful. And a big part of successful is economics. I want my country to be successful in an economic way. And during the initial shutdown, when COVID first hit, um, it was crippling. It was crippling to the economy. People were out of work. People were uh, struggling to pay bills, struggling to buy food. It was a very rough time. And we, I don't think we can actually go back and do that again. I think that would literally just break us. So... We need to do something about that. Right now, according to the Department of Labor uh, Bureau of Statistics, unemployment is, is at 11.1%, and that's actually lower than it had been. 11.1%, one in 10 people are, is not working. From January to the latest stats they have in July, 53 million people have applied for unemployment. 53 million that's almost one-sixth of, of the nation. So that's a little scary, and we can't keep that up, and we can't go back to that. The only way to get past that is to stop the spread of the virus so that businesses can stay open and people can keep jobs and people can keep working. The way to stop the spread of the virus is to wear a mask, socially, social distancing, and wash your hands. And all three of them are important. You can't just do one or two. You need to do all three of them to get us back where we can be a country that is prosperous again. And it's just, um, it's scary. It, it is scary that we are where we are from a, an, econo an economic standpoint. I am very fortunate that my husband's job is considered essential. So he is working. But there are so many people who aren't. And there are local restaurants in my town and around my town that are having employees test positive for COVID-19. And they are having to shut down for three and four days at a time while they do this super deep clean. And that's, you know, people are losing money during that. They're losing sales. They're... Uh, waiters and waitresses and, and workers and cooks are losing money. So we, we've, you know, got to do the best we can to stop the spread of that just for the sake of our country. 
and I, I want our country to be successful, and I, I know you do too. And some people are saying that the government wants to control you or something like that. And I'll, you know, I'll just point out the government's been control, controlling you for years now. Um, the government has been controlling you, uh, quote unquote, for your wel welfare for a while. There are seatbelt laws. There are motorcycle helmet laws. There are, you know, the government taxes you in order to provide for people who are less fortunate and pay for school and that sort of thing. So the government has been helping you help others for quite some time now. So it's not such a big deal to wear four grams of, of you know, porous cloth on your cotton on your face. This, the last thing that I want to talk about is uh, wearing a mask for faith-based reasons. And like I said, I know some of you might want to check out now, but hear me out. The first thing that I'm going to talk about is that a great majority of the United States claims to believe in God or have some sort of um, relationship with God or some sort of religion or faith-based, you know, thing. So when I'm talking to people who uh, who have a faith like Christianity, Juda uh, Judaism, Islam, uh, Hinduism, whatever, I'm talking to a very large portion of the country. I'm specifically going to speak from a Christian viewpoint because I'm a Christian and that's what I'm familiar with and the, those are the scriptures that I'm familiar with. I'm sure that you could use other faith-based books too to make these points, but I'm going to be, you know, talking from the Bible. And the first one I'm going to do is Luke 6:31, which is the golden rule. You've heard it all your life. You learned it in school. Do to others what you would want done to you. And that really doesn't even have to have a, a faith attached to it. It's something that we've learned. A lot of people don't even know it comes from the Bible. They just think it's a little, you know, platitude that you've learned all your life. But it's, it's very true. Do to others what you would want done to you. If you would want someone else to protect you from this virus, if you would want someone else to do their best not to infect you, then you would do the same you would do what you would want your fellow man to do for you. And the corollary to that, or the, I guess the counterpart to that, is what they call the silver rule, which is don't do to someone else what you wouldn't want done to you. It's just the other side of the coin of the golden rule. So if you wouldn't want someone to spread the virus to you by not wearing a mask, then you wouldn't do the same thing to someone else. All right, the next one is a little bit more involved. It is Mark 12, 30, and 31. And it is the two greatest commandments that Jesus gave to us while he was here on the earth. And the first one is, You shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your soul. I probably got those out of order. And the second commandment is, that you should love your neighbor as you love yourself. And then he goes on to say that there are no greater commandments than these, that on everything else, the law, the prophets, everything, hang on these two commandments. So, love your neighbor as you love yourself is one of the top two. It is extremely important in the Christian faith. And there's even an example of that given after that, because a man who is an expert in the law says to Jesus, because they're always trying to trip him up, they said, he said, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, a lot of people know that a Good Samaritan is someone who stops and helps someone, but they don't realize how important that parable is, uh, even in this, and especially in this day and age, um, because the parable of the Good Samaritan involves a Jewish man um, traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho or Jericho to Jerusalem. Feel free to connect, to correct me in comments. Anyway, going between the two, and gets set upon by robbers, beaten up, robbed, left for dead. And then, as he's laying there suffering, a priest walks by. Now, you would think the priest would stop and help the Jewish man. Nope, walks right on past. Then a Levite walks by, and the Levites are the tribe from which priests come from, and he just walks on by. Then a Samaritan comes along, and for this to make 
any kind of impact, you need to understand that the Jews and the Samaritans could not stand each other. They would not even speak to each other. They were just absolutely could not stand one another. For a Samaritan to stop and help a Jew and interact with a Jew was huge. And yet that's exactly what he did. He stopped. He bound up the man's wounds. Excuse me. That was a chair. <laughs> my husband trying to keep my uh, uh, Sophie the cat from destroying the dinner table. Anyway, I'm sorry. Um, the Samaritan bound up his wounds, poured oil and wine on them because that was considered a very, you know, that was a big treatment back then. He put the uh, Jewish man on his animal, doesn't specify, could have been a donkey, could have been an oxen, could have been, you know, anything. But he put the, the man on the animal and he himself walked until they got to an inn. And while they got to the inn, the Samaritan said to the innkeeper, would you please take care of him and make sure he's okay? And he gave him uh, some money to be able to do that and said, if it costs more than I gave you, I will come back. And I will pay you the extra. So, I want you to sort of think of that in today's climate. You can substitute Samaritan and Jew for Republican and Democrat. Uh, mask and no mask. You could put any opposing viewpoint you want to in that. But the outcome is still the same. One helped the other. And so, Jesus said, uh, you know, to, to the expert in the law, he said, okay, who was the neighbor? And the lawyer said, the one who showed mercy. And then Jesus says the most awesome thing ever. He says, go and do likewise. Go and do the same. So what would Jesus do? I think he'd probably wear a mask. Well, he wouldn't need to, but he would encourage people to. <laughs> um, I know that there are a lot of Christians out there who are saying, I don't need to wear a mask because God will protect me. Can God protect you without a mask? Absolutely. God can do anything. Um, but God has given us a lot of tools. He's given us doctors. Remember, Luke was a physician. He has given us uh, testing, which isn't perfect yet, but, you know, we're working on it. He has given people great minds to work on vaccines, and they're doing that right now. And he's given us the, the information we have on masks. He has given us tools, and, you know, it kind of reminds me of that joke about the man who is on top of his house, and there's a flood, and a rowboat comes by and says, can I help you? He's like, no, no, God's going to save me. A motorboat comes by and says, you know, here, I will save you. Get in the boat. He's like, no, God will save me. A helicopter comes by, and, you know, come on, and we'll, we'll let a ladder down. We'll let a ladder down. We'll save you. No, nope, God's going to save me. And he winds up drowning in the flood. And when he gets to heaven, he said, God, I thought you were going to save me. And God said, I sent you a rowboat, a motorboat, and a, and a helicopter. So in other words, God often helps us through other people. And God is helping us right now, I, I believe that, with a mask. So if you don't wear a mask and you don't socially distance and you don't do the things that have been proven to work, you know, and you get to God and say, what happened? It might very well be that he says to you, I gave you doctors. I gave you best practices. I gave you a brain, <laughs> you know, and it just, you know, I, I tried to help you. So it's just really important that you realize that God is protecting you. He's protecting you, right? But, you know, you've got to reach out and, and take the help. So I just, um, you know, I, I just, um, I, I don't always understand where that theory comes from. It's a little bit like snake handling, which, you know, God will protect me. You know, the snake won't bite me because God will protect me. Well, God could certainly protect you from, you know, getting a snake bite, but he also gave you a brain and it's not a great idea to go around picking up copperheads to see if that's going to work or not. So, Yeah. I got a little preachy there. I'm sorry. I said I wasn't going to do that, and I did, but that's okay. Okay, so this was, uh, I do want to say that this video was requested, so I hope that the people that requested it think that I did a good job with it. I hope that some of the points may be struck home with you if you don't like to wear a mask, and I get that you don't like to. I mean, no one wants to walk around wearing a mask. Um, I certainly don't want to, but 
you know, we do what we we do what we can to help the, stop the spread of this and to help our to help our fellow man. I hope you guys are having a good night. I hope that you're safe and that you're well. And I love you guys. And I'll see you later. Bye bye.